I don't know if I can hold on to my faith anymore. I'm getting weary. Well, the God of all grace is gonna show up. He, he called you to his eternal glory. After you have suffered a little while, you've stretched your faith. You've put that faith muscle in gear. God's gonna show up and he's gonna restore you. He's gonna make you strong and firm and steadfast. Peter chapter 5 verses 6 through 10. I want your outside voice or at least your strong voice as we read this and then I'll go back verse by verse and we're going to learn from the Bible today. It's going to be great. Are you ready? Let me hear you again church. Here we go. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast, to him be the power forever and ever. And all the people said, amen. Lord, bless the word into our hearts. Let us hear your voice today in Jesus' name. I wanna focus in first on this phrase right here. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory after you have suffered a little while. Everybody shout out a little while. You ready? A little while. There's something about that phrase, a little while. It reminds me of being a kid and going on a road trip. How many like some road trips out there today? I'm loving some. I just dig getting on the road, you know, and just there's something that's, you know, today that's kind of calming about it. But not when I was a kid. You guys remember that? Maybe you're going on a long trip. And in fact, especially if you have small kids, there's four words that small kids are famous for saying on a trip. You already have them in your mind, don't you? You already know what they are. I don't even have to tell you what they are. In fact, let's just all say them at the same time. What are the four words? Ready? Are we there yet? You remember that question, right? It's like, are we there yet? Right? And what would your dad say? We'll be there in a little while. We took this Myrtle Beach trip a few years ago and I'm like, guys, we'll take our time. We'll stay over. We'll do it in a couple days. I got on the road, task oriented, let's get it done. I decided we're doing all 16 hours in one day. My kids begged me, please never do that again. And they talked to me about how much they love jet airplanes and how cool it is if we just fly instead of drive, right? But what do we say? We don't wanna say, oh guys, it's 16 more hours because we don't want like a meltdown with a three-year-old. Come on somebody, come on parents, toddlers, can I get a witness? We don't want a meltdown. It's like the airlines do the same thing. It's like I was on a jet one time, we were stopped somewhere, I think in Chicago, and you know, they pulled off, I was like, oh, we're getting ready to take off, then they pull off the side, hey folks, somebody's ahead of us, they gotta do something to the plane, uh, we'll just be a few minutes and we'll get on our way. 15 minutes goes by, he comes back and he goes, folks, we've got a couple other things we've gotta do, some other people are ahead of us, thank you for flying with us, be another 20 minutes and we'll have you in the air, and on our way, the destination. You know how the pilots just they have that way of comforting, you know? But after he said that, they turned the engines off. I'm like, it's not gonna be 20 minutes. <laughs> Get your books out, okay? We're, we're gonna be here a while, right? Because they don't wanna say, guys, we'll be here for two and a half hours. They kind of spread it out, 15, oh no, it's 30 more, 45. I think they have a chart of, you know, we're gonna say this and it will help them along. Well, you know, God calls this time a little while. Why is, why do we say dads, why do we say a little while? Because dads and kids, we have different perspectives. Think about it, when you're a kid, time is going super slow. You, it just seems like forever between birthdays, forever between Christmas. Dads, not us. As, as we get older, come on parents, what happens? Time seems to go faster. I don't know what the deal is. It's like, didn't we just have Christmas? Didn't we just have, it's like, hey, it's my birthday. Wasn't it just your birthday like a few weeks ago? It's like time is accelerating to us. We have these different perspectives. We want the trip to be done. And see, when we follow Christ, it's a lot like being on a road trip and God is the driver. And we want to get where we're going. We're waiting on our next breakthrough. We're waiting on things. And we say, God, how long is it going to be? And he says, a little while. In this series, I want to talk to you about what to do when you're waiting. How do you when you're in this season of uncertainty, how, how do you deal with delays? How do you deal with uncertainty? 
not knowing what the future holds. How do you deal with anxiety? See, we're all waiting for something. You might be, you know, waiting on like, man, where's that, where's that person I'm gonna marry? When am I gonna meet the person I'll spend the rest of my life with? You might be waiting on a promotion. I mean, I think that's pretty safe to say we're all waiting for COVID to be over, amen. Can I get a witness today, right? We're waiting, we're waiting. But see, here's the thing. When we're, what, how do we handle that waiting? Because God says right here, he goes, you know what? In a little while, after you suffered, after this season of suffering, in a little while, God is gonna restore you and make you strong for, we're like, all right, man, in a little while. But God's timetable is not the same as our timetable. In fact, God doesn't have this kind of schedule. Hey, I'm up at seven, I've got my coffee at eight, I'm hanging out with you know, Jesus and the Holy Spirit at nine, I've got, you know, I've got meetings at noon, I'm having lunch with Gabriel. God's not on a timetable like that. God is an interdimensional being. He exists outside of time. So God is like, looks into time, but he's not on our time. So when God says a little while, you don't know how long that little while is going to be. How do we handle that waiting series? Um, and the truth is you can learn, you've got to learn how to rule your spirit while you're waiting to arrive at the next destination for your life. And many people, while they're waiting, here's what we're doing, we're wrestling. While we're waiting, we're wrestling with worry. We're wrestling with fear of what's gonna happen. We're wrestling with the what if, we're wrestling with anxiety. Did you know this year, this is gonna come as no surprise to anybody, mental health apps went up in the first part of the year, 27% mental health apps. Like, what's, I, I need some help for my mind. On election week, they went up 3,000%, right? They went up about 30% on election week. I mean, that's a lot of people recognizing, man, I need some help, not just with my body, but I, I need some help with my mind. Why? Because there's a lot of things we have to worry about. There's health to worry about, your family, there's your kids, there's earthquakes, there's fires, there's the economy, there's the future. But here's what we have to understand about worry. There's such a thing as a healthy fear to where we're like, listen, I'm gonna have wisdom and I'm gonna do things right. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a good thing about that, but they're, they're really what people are dealing with a lot of is an unhealthy fear. It's called anxiety and it's called worry. And there is a weight to worry. Have you felt it before? There's like an emotional, it's like there's a heaviness about worry. There, there's an impact on our lives. Fear and worry will rob you of your joy. Fear and worry will rob you, will squeeze the life out of you. In fact, in one language, the word anxiety is the same word for strangle. You ever feel like anxiety is strangling your faith and your hope? You ever feel like anxiety is trying to squeeze the life out of you? That's the power that it has. And so Peter, he's gonna address all these issues in these verses. I'm gonna go by them verse by verse. And we're gonna talk about how do we end up right here where you are strong and firm and steadfast. But before we get here, we're gonna go all the way back up to verse six. I'm gonna take you through this process. You're gonna to learn today. God's gonna to give you wisdom. You're gonna get revelation. God's gonna open our hearts and minds to his word so we can have a stronger faith in uncertain times. And what we're gonna find as we pop back up to verse six is strong faith doesn't begin with a real confident mind. Strong faith doesn't begin with a great education. Strong faith doesn't begin with like really good looks or success. Strong faith begins with humility. Verse number six, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. You see, the posture of power in God's mind is not like this. The posture of power is on our knees in prayer. If we wanna have a stronger faith, it starts by humility, by acknowledging, hey, wait a minute, I'm not God. He's in the driver's seat. I'm limited. I don't understand everything. And I'm gonna trust that he knows how to get us where we're going and he will bring us safely home. Somebody say amen today, right? God is in the driver's seat. But see, here's the thing with worry. A lot of times you'll have worse worry if you have control issues. And how many here have control issues? I'll put my hand up twice. I, I like to know the outcome. I like to be like, hey, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and the outcome's gonna be this. I like to be in control. And certainly there are things that are within our control and we need to do the right thing inside of that circle of control. But here's the crazy thing. There's a lot of things in life, even pre-COVID, a lot of things are out of our control. What are we gonna do there? I'll just do a quick test to see if you've got control issues and, and I'll ask you one question that will let you know if you've got control issues like me. You ready? Here's the question. 
do you help other people drive? Come on, be honest. <laughs> Who here helps other people drive? I'll give you like four ways. Number one, only when they ask. Number two, only when they're doing it wrong. Number three, when you think they're gonna do it wrong. Or four, all of the above. I'm four, okay? <laughs> Like I just tell, if I'm a passenger, which is actually rare, I don't like not being in control. And so one thing that drives me nuts is if somebody's driving and they're just looking at me and they're telling me a story and I'll tell you what, and da, 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 da. And they're wanting me to look at them. And I will not look at them because somebody here needs to be looking at the road. And if you're not looking at the road, I'm looking at the road. So they're talking, I'm just like, you know, I'm looking at the road. And if I see the brake lights, I will let you know, right? Yes, I'm that guy. <laughs> Hey, you know, it's up there, two cars, you see him? You know, it's like, there's a control thing there. A strong faith starts with realizing God's in the driver's seat. There's things I don't understand. I don't understand God's timeline. I don't understand everything that's going on, but a strong faith starts with a humility of recognizing, man, God is way bigger than me. And listen, when I can't even see his hand, I can trust his heart and I know he has my best interest in mind. That's that humbling yourselves, but it doesn't just say humble yourselves under God. It says, look at this, humble yourselves under God's what? Say this word really loud, what? Mighty hand. Why doesn't it just say humble under God? Because mighty hand means something. Whenever scripture says the hand of the Lord was with them, you know what it means? That the power of God came into play. When scripture says the mighty hand of God, when scripture in the disciples in the early church, it says, and the disciples went out and preached the gospel and the hand of the Lord was with them. And here's what it says next. And signs and wonders followed them. In other words, he's reminding us that as we acknowledge that God's in the driver's seat and he's bigger than me, we're also saying, and he's strong and he's mighty and he likes bringing his power in play. So that's why it says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand, the mighty power of God that he loves to bring into our lives. Let's just bring this into perspective right now. This is the same hand that made our universe. This is the same hand that made the sun. This is the same power that made the stars. This is the power that actually brought Christ into the world to be born of a baby. This is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead after he was in the tomb for three days. It's the same power that brings new life into our lives when we give our lives to Christ, the power that changes our hearts, the power that changes our families. This is the power of God's spirit that gives us spiritual gifts so we can do what God has called us to do while we're here on earth. Yes, it's the power of the blessing we sang about today, church. The blessing that falls on our lives when we walk with him in faithfulness. It's the power that God gives you and me. Check it out. He gives us power to obey him. And when I obey him, that blessing begins to multiply. It is power, my friends, church family, hear me. This is power for our lives today. Not just some, oh man, he's up there. No, he says the mighty hand of God. Hand means he wants to use his mighty hand in our lives. It is for us today, but it's only access through humility. The power of posture is on our knees in prayer. So step number one is humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Verse number seven, he moves on in the strong faith passage. And he says, now we have to learn how to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for you. I'll say it again, anxiety is powerful. In fact, it's so powerful, I think that when you look at scripture, and psychologists even tell us this now, we're not really designed, our psyche, we're not really designed to live through this fear mode. We're not designed to live with anxiety. How do I know that? Because it tears our body up when it's in us and on us. Fear and worry eat us alive. It's, in, in fact, it's kind of like, it, it's kind of like the more you think about the what ifs and the dark, it's kind of like cutting a hole in the bottom of your gas tank and you're just draining the life and the energy. And sometimes you felt like, man, anxiety is draining my faith and worry is draining my hope, right? And fear is draining the peace out of my life. There's this buzzword in the uh, psychology community is called ruminating. You know what ruminating is? Ruminating is when you think about, okay, there's that bad thing that happened in your life, or there's that what if, 
or there's all these weird scenarios. And ruminating is when you, it doesn't just like come into your mind, you keep it in your mind. You think about it, talk about it, 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 and it begins to kind of get a momentum in your life. They say a large percentage of suicides in our world happen after a season of ruminating. Ruminating is when I meditate on the what ifs, is when I allow the doubt and fear to build up strong and to fill my life. How do I deal with that? Well, Peter says, you gotta get that off you and onto God because God knows how to carry your burden. God knows how to carry that anxiety. God is designed to carry it. That's why he actually says right here, he doesn't just say, hey, cast your anxiety on him. He reminds us because he cares for you. When I trust God's care, I can trust God with my care. When I trust God's care, then I can trust God with my care. He says, I want you to cast. How do I do that? Pastor, listen, in prayer, we say, Lord, in fact, you could even sometimes I've, to, to help me as a point of contact, similar, like I'm going to hold something that I'm dealing with, my issue in my hand. I'm going to say, Lord, this is a weight. This is the anxiety of this. I'm not going to carry it with me. I'm going to cast it on you. I'm going to give it to God. Here's a cool acronym I found for faith. It is um, forward all issues to heaven. You got issues in your life. I got issues in my life. Most of us have multiple things we're dealing with at one time. You're not designed to carry the weight of all that at the same time. See, here's the thing about the Bible. The Bible is not just some like, you know, song where someone says, don't worry, be happy. That's a nice melody, but it can be really shallow. The Bible is not just some akuna matata. Hey, just don't worry about anything akuna matata. The Bible gives us concrete principles on dealing with fear and worry in our life. The Bible gives us a concrete path to walk in a steadfast love and a firm faith. And so we've gotta learn, listen, I gotta forward all of these issues to God. I do that when I pray. Actually, when you worship, you're, you're saying, God, you're bigger. That can be another way that you cast those cares when you speak the word of God over your life. But we need to many times make a, a very definite decision, Lord, I'm casting this onto you. You might think, but I, I kind of still feel afraid. Yeah, sometimes we do, but it doesn't mean we don't trust. In fact, look at this other acronym I found for faith. Feeling afraid, I trust him. Would you say that with me today? Feeling afraid, I trust him. You can still feel fear, but then you can make a decision that I'm gonna trust. And the more you do that, the more that trust begins to take preeminence in your life. So I gotta humble myself. And then the second thing I gotta do is say, I gotta offload all this weight, this anxiety, all the what ifs. Lord, I'm, I'm not designed to care. I'm gonna offload it to you. And then in verse eight, he reminds us something that we need to be alert with. In verse eight, he says, now I want you to be alert. I want you to be, have a sober mind because you have an enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. He tells you, number one, that you have an enemy. And number two, he tells you the strategy of the enemy. When you know the strategy of your enemy, you, you have an advantage. When you have the game plan of the other team, you're playing from a good place. So he's not only letting us know, you might say, be thinking, uh, pastor, do you really believe there's an actual devil? I do because Jesus did. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. He also said that he is the father of lies. He says every time he speaks, he lies because he is the father of lies. So the first thing he says is, listen, I want you to be alert, right? Everybody shout out, wake up. You ready? One, two, three, wake up. He's like, hey, don't go through life not knowing There's, there is a spiritual force out there. There's an enemy and he wants to take you down. He wants you to get you to give up on your faith, give up, uh, give up hope. He wants you to throw in the towel, say, I don't know if I wanna live for God anymore. There's an enemy out there that's targeting you and that should bring an alertness to your life. Like, wait a minute, okay, this deal is real. We was on vacation a few years ago and at the resort we were staying at, I started hearing some buzz out back by the pool. People were like, there's a tarantula. I'm like, oh, okay, and then somebody else, hey, there's a tarantula. And some people are scurrying around, there's a tarantula. And I'm like, I kind of got an alert kind of followed the crowd, there were, there's a bunch of people around, there was a tarantula right there. And I'm like, man, I'm, 
I'm going to watch where I step. I'm going to look under my bed sheet. I, you know, how many of these? And one guy said, don't worry about it. He goes, tell you what, you really want to see a lot of these. He says, you come back to this area in September. He goes, there's all kinds of these things. And then they draw these giant wasps that prey on them. So there's this big competition with these tarantulas and giant wasps. I'm thinking, yeah, you know, that's exactly the kind of vacation I was hoping for is I need to go somewhere where there's giant tarantulas and giant wasps and I'll just kind of enjoy my life through that. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> But every said that, I'm like, I'm a little bit more alert. I'm kind of walking around looking at corners and in tarantulas, right? And God doesn't say this to, to scare us. He just uh, uh, warn us. But what he really wants us to know is he wants to know how the enemy works in our lives. Because Peter tells us right there. He doesn't say the enemy's a lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He says the enemy works like a roaring lion, right, in the jungle, How's that strategy work? Well, the Bible says that we are the sheep of his pasture, that Jesus is our shepherd and we are his sheep. Now, sheep are defenseless animals. They need a shepherd. Sheep are also dumb. It's not the greatest compliment in the world to be called the sheep, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a picture of God caring for us. But a sheep, I mean, they need to be guided. They, they don't have it. I mean, if, if one sheep goes off a cliff, the next sheep behind him will also go off the cliff. The next sheep behind him without a shepherd will go off the cliff. I would think that, you know, sheep number three would be like, huh, Bob went that way and I don't see Bob anymore. Maybe I shouldn't do it. That's what I would think. But sheep don't think that way. They're like, okay, here we go. You did it. I'm going to do it too. Woo! You know? Sheep need a shepherd. They need guidance. They're defenseless animals. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd that lays his life down for the sheep. Jesus is our shepherd. We're supposed to follow him. He's watching over the herd. Now the lion comes in. You've seen the shows. What is the lion's strategy? He roars on purpose. What's he doing? He's trying to get one of the animals to jump out of the herd. He's trying to get one of the animals in a paranoid condition. He, he roars and, and the fear of that thing to where he can isolate one of those animals. Listen, when you run from the shepherd, when, when, the, when they jump out of the herd, something happens. The very next thing that happens, you know what it is? Lunch for the lion happens, right? It's like, there's lunch. We've seen those shows like, oh man, oh, is it? but you know, the lion's got to eat. But see, that's just a picture of this is one of the ways the enemy tries to mess with you is to get you in fear and anxiety, try to get you to jump away, try to really honestly to get you to move away from the shepherd. He also works by telling us lies. The enemy will lie to us and you'll hear these in your mind. You'll think it's just you or you'll think it's God, but it's really the enemy. And it'll be things like this. God doesn't really care. God doesn't really love you. It'll be a lie like, you know what? You've messed up too many times. God's done with you. It'll be a lie like, you know what? You can't have blessing in your life anymore. You won't have joy again. It'll be a lie like you don't have any purpose in your life. You just kind of you just kind of exist. You're just an accident. The enemy loves to spread lies. He loves to plant doubt in your mind. He loves to plant fear. He loves to plant insecurity. It's what he does. So let me ask you this. What is your strategy, church, when the lion roars? What is your strategy? When, when the lion is roaring, when fear comes, here's what we do, we look to the shepherd. When worry comes, we look to the shepherd. When lies come, we speak the truth of the word of God. Listen, God has made me, I'm made in the image of God. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a purpose and a plan. Jeremiah 29 tells me that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. I'm created with God's destiny in mind. What is your strategy when the lion roars? You look to the shepherd and you stay with the shepherd. Church family, can I encourage you today? Stay with the shepherd, stay in the flock. There's a blessing there because the shepherd, he's the one that's gonna see you through. He's the one that's gonna get you home. I've gotta humble myself, cast my care, recognize that. And here's what I found is that you will cast your care to the degree that you believe that God is for you. You will cast your care on the Lord to the degree that you believe that God loves you. You will cast your care and you will trust him to the degree that you believe that God is with you. And when you believe that God is for you and that God is with you and that God is in you, you'll say, Lord, I am going to trust you. I'm gonna walk with you because I know that you are the good shepherd that laid your life down and I know that I can trust him. Verse number nine it says, here's what you do with that. When that roar comes, he says, you resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Church, can I tell you today, stand firm in your faith. 
because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. What was he saying to them? All the people are getting persecuted. The enemy's trying to stamp out the church before it gets too strong to handle. Can I tell you something? It's now too strong to handle, okay? This was in the early day. And see, here's, there's a principle here that it helps all of us though. He says, you know what? You can stand firm in your faith because you know, here it is, you're not the only one going through it. I mean, even outside of the world of COVID, we have these thoughts. I'm the only person going through this. I'm the only person that's made that mistake. I'm the only person that's having this family dynamic issue. And he comes in and he says, you are not the only one. But what we have to do is there will be moments in your life when that fear tries to come in, when the lies of the enemy tries to come in. And here's what I'm gonna tell you right here is where most people, the thing that most people don't do is verse nine. Resist him. Come on, somebody shout out resist. You ready? One, two, three. Resist, right? Say resist him. One, two, three. Resist him. In other words, everything that comes into my mind, I'm not just supposed to go with it. There are some things that you have to resist. Now listen, if, if there's nothing in your life that you're resisting, you might not be doing it right. Because some people think, man, I become a Christian. Everything's going to be easy. It'll be a breeze now. I'll just flow with God. But here's the thing, in one way, when you become a Christian, there's kind of a target on your back because the devil hates God. You're created in the image of God. When you want to live for God, the enemy challenges everything God does. He tried to send a Moses as the deliverer and, and the guy in charge said, we're gonna kill all the babies. He tried to challenge what God wanted to do. Same thing when Jesus was born, there's a king. So the guy in charge, the, you know, the secular guy in charge said, let's kill all the babies. Anything God is doing, the enemy wants to challenge. So there's gonna be moments in your life where you have to say, no, I resist that thought. No, I resist that fear. No, I resist that temptation that's coming into my life. And what happens when you resist? Come on, all my muscle people, all my protein people out there, what happens when you resist? You get stronger. Because the reality is your faith is like a muscle. You know, I love cardio, I do cardio, but you know, everybody tells me that, it's like, hey, listen, if you really want to build your muscles, you've got to do resistance training, right? This is all the rage right now. Hey, listen, you want to get stronger, you got to do resistance training. And sometimes when you're pushing those weights, it feels like, wait a minute, I'm getting weaker. My muscles are breaking down. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Sometimes when you're in a situation and you're like doing all you can to trust God, like, Lord, we're putting our faith in you, we're casting our care, and it feels like your faith's getting weaker, and it feels like it's breaking down. Yeah, but guess what? Then God comes to restore. He comes to add strength. And guess what happens? Then those muscles that were about to break, they actually begin to come back. And what do they do? They come back stronger. They come back bigger. They come back better. You want to see some people that's got some really strong faith? Look at a believer that's been walking with the Lord for a long time. Look at somebody who's, who's just, hey, listen, I've gone through this season, I've gone through that season, and guys, this is the season, we are going through it. I've gone through that trial, I've gone through this temptation, I've gone through that, and they have learned, listen, the enemy comes, he roars, he lies, but I resist him, and then God shows up. And people that have got these big faith muscles, basically, it's because they've watched the faithfulness of God again and again and again and again and that's why when craziness happens, they seem to be the ones that are just a little bit more calm and a little bit more assuring. Why? Because they have a strong faith, even when they don't know the outcome, because they've learned how to build the spiritual muscle. And then you get to the result of all this thing, verse number 10. The result, verse number 10, he says, and then the God of all grace. God's like, you know what? You just begin to walk this path. You say, Lord, I, I'm gonna humble myself before. I'm gonna take the posture of power, which is on my knees in prayer. I'm gonna take the posture of power, which is surrendering to you. I'm gonna recognize you're bigger than anything that's going on in my life. And Lord, your mighty hand is so powerful, you can come and do mighty things in my life. I'm gonna learn to cast my care on you. I'm gonna resist the enemy. He comes like a roaring lion. I'm gonna say no to the thoughts that the enemy brings into my life. And God says, and I'm gonna come and I'm gonna bring strength into your life.